All right. Good morning, uh, everybody. Happy Friday. Um, welcome to this week's uh, AMSSM Sports Ultrasound case series. Um, as with uh, two weeks ago, we're continuing with our excellent fellow presentations. Um, this week, we are joined by Marianne Lutmer. Um, she she was a medical student at, uh, at Mayo, followed by her um, PM&R residency also at Mayo Clinic. She um, then did her and is currently doing her sports medicine fellowship out in uh, Pittsburgh at U UPMC, and then is heading back to the uh, lovely snow-filled cold of Rochester. Um, afterwards, well, she will uh, rejoin Mayo as a, as a staff doc. Um, so today, pretty interesting case. She's going to be talking about Halleck Saltans. Um, and with that, I will turn it over to Marianne. Okay, I'm sharing my screen here. Okay, can everybody see? Good to go. All right, well, thank you for the introduction. I have no disclosures, but I would like to thank my mentors, uh, both doctors Onishi and leaders here at UPMC, my mentors at Mayo, and I also would really like to thank uh, Drs. Hall, Hoffman, and Cruz, and AMSSM for organizing and putting on this case series, which has been a very helpful learning experience. Um, I highly encourage you all to see Dr. Sellen's presentation of the medial ankle. Um, it's hard to follow, but I will do my very best. So our objectives today are to review the protocol to meet a diagnostic ultrasound criteria for a complete sonographic examination of the medial ankle, and we'll describe those findings in an ultrasound report. So we'll go over this in the context of a single case, so I won't be presenting a comprehensive review of all of the possible pathology in the medial ankle. So starting with our case, we had a 47-year-old female nurse who had an 18-month history of right medial foot pain. She had had a fall and sustained a non-displaced navicular fracture one year prior, and she continued to have repeated pain despite the fact that the MRI showed complete healing. She had pain that was seven out of 10 in severity and exacerbated by great toe extension, plantar flexion, and prolonged standing. She described it as being sharp and sometimes achy and associated with a click. She had no numbness, tingling, weakness, or ankle instability. She was pretty debilitated, unable to drive or stand more than 10 minutes at a time. Custom orthotics made it worse. She couldn't tolerate PT and she hadn't had any injections. So on exam, she was very intelligent on the right side. She didn't have any swelling, but she was very point tender, just plantar to the right navicular and along the medial arch. This was exacerbated by passive extension of the right great toe, uh, and we were not able to elicit any triggering with that, however. Uh, she had normal range of motion, strength, sensation, and reflexes, and a negative 10 L's at the medial ankle. So uh, as others have described, it's really important to look at the available imaging that has been done prior to doing your ultrasound exam. She had had previously uh, reported two normal MRIs, and I just have a sneak peek of what we'll be talking about later. It's a sagittal T1 image through the master knot of Henry. Uh, we didn't have the radiographs available, although I, was, I would have them here for us. Um, but we did review that MRI before proceeding with a diagnostic ultrasound of the medial ankle. Um, we actually did a limited exam, and so the images that I'm gonna go over for the review of the protocol are images that I took on a normal ankle and then we'll go over the specific pathology that we found in her case. So this is AMSSM's checklist for the recommended complete examination of the medial ankle, starting with the posterior tibialis tendon and muscle, flexor digitorum longus tendon and muscle, the tibial nerve and its branches, the tibial uh, artery and veins, flexor hallucis longus tendon, the deltoid ligament, and the medial tibial tailor joint. As Dr. Sullen mentioned, you can also include the flexor retinaculum with or without a dynamic assessment, uh, which involves a resisted inversion. And you can also evaluate the saphenous nerve. And as others have also mentioned, uh, in the ankle and the foot, it's often common for them to overlap. So you may need to scan posterior or plantar regions to make sure you cover uh, things on your differential diagnosis. 
So for scanning the ankle, you're going to want a high frequency linear array transducer with a small footprint uh, using extra gel to try to maintain contact over the bony prominences. You can have the patient in ipsilateral decubitus or supine with their lower limb externally rotated to give you access to the medial ankle. It can be helpful to put the towel under the ankle. You want to use sonal palpation tenderness to your uh, advantage. And so you can have the patient mark the area or as you're going through, try to elicit pain as these structures are all close together and it can be challenging to sort out which is uh, the most problematic for the patient. And then again, you want to review prior imaging. So starting out, we're transverse at the tarsal tunnel. And if you remember from anatomy class, we have Tom, Dick, and very nervous Harry. So tibialis posterior, which is to the left or anterior and then flexor digitorum longus, the tibial artery, veins, and nerve. And then we have a hypoechoic, which is due to anisotropy, flexor hallucis longus tendon. You want to wag your transducer to try to eliminate the anisotropy. And then it is normal here, and you note that tibialis posterior is a bit larger than FDL and FHL. And then I apologize, anterior is actually to the right in this slide, otherwise I try to keep it consistent. You can see the retinaculum overlying the tarsal tunnel, it's a hyperechoic line. And here's where you can do dynamic evaluation with resisted inversion. And you're gonna to wanna to look for tibialis posterior to perch or sublux anteriorly over the medial malleolus, which would suggest a deficiency in the retinaculum over the tarsal tunnel. You can then scan more posteriorly and look for its insertion onto the calcaneus. And then moving on, we can see the tendons in long axis. We can look at tibialis posterior. And so here we can see it has a bit of a broader insertion onto the navicular before continuing on to its insertions on the medial cuneiform as well as the second through fourth metatarsals. It is normal for it to appear a little bit broad and thickened and a little bit hypoechoic prior to its insertion on the navicular. And you see a little bit of loss of fibrillar pattern because those fibers are, and they're diverging and kind of spreading out as they move on to continue to the medial cuneiform and then around to the uh, second through fourth metatarsals. So for flexor digitorum longus or FDL and flexor hallucis longus or FHL, a landmark here that's helpful is a bony protuberance on the calcaneus called the sustenaculum tali. And FDL is more dorsal or anterior, while FHL lies more plantar and posterior. And so that is on this image localized here. And when we scan distally, we're going to want to watch for the crossover of FDL over FHL. And FDL is going to continue more plantar towards the toes, and FHL is going to go towards the base of the hallux. And so here we are. I'll try to pause it. If it takes a minute, my mouse sometimes disappears on Zoom, so I'm trying to find it. And so as we go through. So here we see FDL perched on top of the sustenaculum tali, and then FHL. Overlying that, we see our nice hyperechoic honeycomb structure of the tibial nerve. So we're still following FDL, FHL. And here's where they cross over. So I'll let that play one more time and try to see if you can follow that. This is often associated uh, at the master knot of Henry or that overlap with irritation of the medial plantar nerve, but it depends on where that nerve branches. And we'll talk about that a little more later. So here it is in long axis. We see FDL over FHL, and then the same correlate on MRI. And then moving on to the tibial neurovascular bundle, this is a better image of our tibial nerve, that nice honeycomb hyperechoic structure with the tibial artery overlying that, flanked on either side by the veins I don't demonstrate it here, but whenever you're looking at veins versus arteries, you can use compressibility as well as Doppler flow.
And so for those of you who aren't aware, or haven't read Dr. Presley and Dr. Smith's paper on the first branch of the lateral plantar nerve, it was really helpful for me as I was trying to understand this anatomy. It has really uh, helpful cadaveric dissections and diagrams that demonstrate the course of these nerves. And so the first branch off the tibial nerve is the medial calcaneal nerve, which is a sensory nerve. It's typically proximal to the tarsal tunnel. And so we're gonna follow the tibial nerve here and we're gonna look at about two or three o'clock here for a little fascicle. Right here, that's gonna branch off and it's gonna head superficially, that's your clue. We'll let that keep playing over the calcaneus and it's gonna give sensory innervation to the skin over the posterior medial heel. So we'll let that play one more time. We see it right here, heading superficial. And next we have the tibial nerve branching into the medial and lateral plantar nerves. We have anterior to the left, posterior to the right. And so the medial, uh, medial plantar nerve is a little bit more anterior in its course. So here we see the medial plantar nerve more anterior and the lateral plantar nerve. And now we're gonna watch them as I scan more proximally, come back together for the tibial nerve proper. And we'll play that one more time. And then the first branch of the lateral plantar nerve is also known as Baxter's nerve, and it takes a more vertical course as it heads plantarly, and then eventually it'll be more lateral as it goes on to innervate the abductor digiti minimi. And so there we go. So again, anteriors to the left, posteriors to the right, and we have the medial plantar nerve, the lateral plantar nerve, and then we see this little fascicle that's gonna branch off and head towards the abductor halysis and quadratus plantae interval, which we'll show uh, in a minute. And then something that Dr. Sellen mentioned that I found really helpful is that the vessel can help identify the lateral plantar nerve because it often comes down and splits between the lateral plantar nerve and Baxter's nerve. So we're gonna watch that here. So now we have the lateral plantar nerve and the first branch of the lateral plantar nerve we're going to watch it continue into this interval between abductor halysis and the quadratus plantae. We're going to watch it come back to the lateral plantar nerve, and there's medial. So we'll let that play one more time. And so here's a still image. Here's our lateral plantar nerve. Here's the first branch or Baxter's nerve. And it's vulnerable to compression between the abductor halysis and the quadratus plantae. And it is a sensory motor mixed nerve and it can, it'll provide innervation to the abductor digiti minimi or ADM. And so if you're concerned about Baxter's neuropathy, you're gonna wanna check for denervation atrophy of ADM. Uh, so it may look a little more hypoechoic and that'll clue you in or kind of build your case uh, for Baxter's neuropathy. So the saphenous nerve, which is the, the terminal branch of the femoral nerve, is at this point a sensory nerve. It's more commonly evaluated at the knee, but you can see it at the ankle. Some way to find it is to look at the great saphenous vein. So try to avoid using excess transducer pressure and that'll help clue you in to where the saphenous nerve is. You may find it a little bit quicker if that person does have saphenous neuritis at the ankle because they may be a little more tender or have a tenels at the ankle. And then moving on to the deltoid ligament, there's multiple components with a superficial and a deep layer. So we have the tibial navicular, the tibial spring, which I'm not gonna actually have in, in today's slides because we didn't include the plantar calcaneal navicular or spring ligament. Although um, I would recommend going through Dr. Sellen's presentation. He has an excellent slide on the tibial spring ligament. Then we have the tibial calcaneal and the superficial posterior tibial tailor. 
And then in the deep layer, deep layer we have the anterior and posterior tibiotalar. So going through those one at a time, uh, we have uh, the tibia on the left, uh, and so more plantar or anterior is to the right. And we can see that the tibionavicular, which comes from the anterior colliculus of the tibia, is superficial. And then we have the deep anterior tibiotalar ligament. And so one way to, to try to evaluate these is you can put your uh, transducer over the medial malleolus and anchor the proximal end. And then as you go, you can rotate the distal end posteriorly, and then you'll sweep across these ligaments and then just try to connect the dots uh, between the bony structures that they're named for. So if we move the distal end of the transducer more plantarly, so it's nearly vertical, we can see the tibial calcaneal ligament, which attaches to the sustenaculum tali of the calcaneus. You can see the tibialis posterior overlying that. It's a little bit oval shaped because we are oblique to it. Uh, this view will also give you an excellent visualization of the tibiotalar joint here and the subtalar joint here. And if you're concerned for an articular pathology, you're going to want to look at the sinus tarsi or the lateral subtalar joint for any fluid. And when you do that, you want to hang the foot off the side of the bed because the fluid can be dependent and you can end up chasing it around the ankle. And so that will help you if you look in the dependent regions. This ligament, uh, the tibial calcaneal, is a little bit easier to visualize with the foot in dorsiflexion. So you can have the patient do that for you or you can hold them in that position. And then finally, sweeping that plantar aspect of your probe more posterior, you can find the superficial as well as the deep posterior tibiotalar ligament. And here we have a nice, uh, more short axis view of the posterior tibialis tendon overlying the superficial and deep posterior tibiotalar ligament. And so if you're having trouble finding this ligament, you can follow the posterior tibialis either from proximal to distal or distal to proximal and you'll run across it. And this, this ligament is also a little bit easier visualized in dorsiflexion. And so going back to our case now, um, all of the previous findings were normal except for what we're gonna go over. And so we're gonna take a closer look at the crossover of FDL over FHL at the master knot of Henry. And so here we see FDL, which is anterior and dorsal to the sustenaculum tali, and FHL, which is a little posterior and plantar, and is a little hypoechoic again due to anisotropy. And as we go through, we're going to have you look for FDL over FHL deep to the abductor halysis. So right here. And even though we did wag the transducer to try to correct for anisotropy, one thing that we did notice was that there was hypoechoic enlargement of both tendons. And this isn't the greatest. I have a better image coming up here to show that the FHL is actually more enlarged relative to the FDL. It looks opposite in this picture. Um, but what stood out the most to us was that she had significant sonopalpation tenderness right over the crossover of those tendons. And so we did scan the FHL in its entirety to its insertion on the distal phalanx because there have been reports of uh, entrapment or uh, triggering between the fibrosis tunnel at the sesamoids with the FHL. Uh, we did not see any evidence of that. And actually throughout the scan, we didn't see any evidence of the triggering that she had been describing. And so this is just a better image. We can see FDL over FHL. Both are very hypoechoic uh, with FHL slightly more enlarged than FDL. Um, and then we can see some injectate flow. She did undergo a peritendinous FHL injection with corticosteroid, uh, did an extensive physical therapy program and is now four months out and uh, has resumed all activity. So now comes one of the hard parts for me uh, at this point is all one of the hardest parts is trying to translate what we saw into words. And so going over the complete diagnostic ultrasound report, you want to start with the basics. So the referral, what was the chief complaint or purpose of the visit? 
who performed it, what was the indication, was there a specific question as to what you were asked to rule out, and then list the comparison studies that you reviewed. And then if you're not writing a separate consult note, it can be helpful to say a little bit about the history and presentation, because if you end up taking over the care of this patient, uh, it may be helpful to reference back as you're, as you're going through. And so then we mentioned that it's a complete diagnostic ultrasound of the right medial ankle. We used the 18-5, 22-8 megahertz linear array, so list your transducer, and then we list the machine that we performed it on. And then Dr. Onishi has been helping me to describe what I see rather than putting a diagnosis in the body of the report. So instead of saying, I saw FHL tendinosis, um, we'll go over what findings led us to that conclusion. And that will be in the summary. So going over, uh, so there's been multiple ways that people have presented the report order. So some like to put the pathology first, uh, and some like to follow the checklist. I just put the checklist order here as we go through, in part because at this point in time, I still wanna go straight to the uh, place of pathology when I'm doing my scan. And so I'm trying to re remember to kind of go through in a nice orderly fashion uh, so I don't miss anything. And so that's kind of how I presented the report here today. And so going over the structures, uh, we like to mention what region of the structure that we scanned, because it can not only demonstrate your understanding of the anatomy, uh, and the thoroughness of your scan um, and just kind of gives an idea to the readers what portion was evaluated and so that there potentially could be pathology that you didn't necessarily evaluate. So for posterior tibialis tendon, we scanned it from the level of the flexor retinaculum to its insertion on the divicular and we didn't see any visible abnormality. The FDL tendon and muscle was scanned from the level of the flexor retinaculum to just distal to the master knot of Henry, which I describe as the intersection with FHL. It was highly enlarged at the master knot of Henry and associated with sonopalpation tenderness. The FHL, similarly, we listed that it scanned from the level of the flexor retinaculum to its insertion on the distal phalanx of the hallux. There was hypoechoic enlargement of the flexor hallucis longus tendon relative to the flexor digitorum longus with associated sonopalpation tenderness. And then key here that we like to mention that it reproduced her pain that she came in to see us for. And then the remainder of the tendon was without visible abnormality. Similarly, we described the tibial nerve and that we scanned it from the several centimeters proximal to the tarsal tunnel and then distally into its branches, all of which were without focal abnormality. Tibial artery and vein were scanned from the proximal tarsal tunnel to the hind foot and then you can list the components of the deltoid ligament if you'd like. Um, otherwise, you can say it was scanned and was uh, without visible abnormality or normal. And then we mentioned that we didn't see any effusion in the medio tibio tailor joint. And then if you happen to scan any more structures, you can list them as well. So the saphenous nerve was identified and we didn't notice any sound patient tenderness over that nerve. And then the flexor retinaculum was intact. Dynamic evaluation with resisted inversion did not cause anterior subluxation of the posterior tibialis tendon. So now in the summary, we can say that the primary findings on this examination are sonopalpation tenderness at the master knot of Henry with hypoechoic enlargement of the flexor hallux's longus tendon relative to the flexor digitorum longus. This is consistent with hallux saltans at the master knot of Henry. And then we also list, uh, in case people aren't familiar with that, term, um, some other terms that have been used, such as FHL tendinopathy, stenosing tenus synovitis, or trigger toe. And then we list our plan and our diagnosis, which is right hallux saltans at the master knot of Henry. So thank you. And then I'd, I'd like to open it up to any comments or any other uh, questions that people have. All right, great job, Marian. That was <clears throat> that was really well done. You know, the medial ankle can get a little dicey um, and can be a bit of a challenging scan. So, so great job. Um, I just have I have two points and then um, potentially a, a, a question here. You know, you you talked about sonopalpatory pain quite a bit, and you know, I think that can oftentimes be underutilized. I mean, I use it so much when I'm doing my scans, and I think can really add helpful information. Um, you know, a lot of times we'll see pathology in a region, but they don't have any pain over there. So, you know, probably not the culprit of their symptoms. So I think, you know, using sonal palpation can be, um, can be really helpful. So like, like you alluded to, I will comment on that. 
um, pretty frequently in, in most of my scans. Um, the other comment just to make, you know, with the, um, with the tibial nerve and the tarsal tunnel, as well as its corresponding branches, there's, there's a ton of abnormal, I'm sorry, of variability um, in, in, in the way that these nerve branches course um, and where they come off the tibial nerve. So what I'll often do is, is once I see a branch from the tibial nerve, I'll follow it out distally just to confirm, you know, that truly, you know, the medial calcaneal nerve is going, um, you know, to the, uh, uh, to the appropriate location, just in case there is, you know, some sort of, of, a, of a barren course there. Um, and then I guess my only question here, you know, in this patient, obviously we really, really couldn't reproduce the, uh, the subjective triggering. I mean, what are your thoughts on, on this patient as to where they truly were triggering? That's a good question. And we actually talked about that a little bit. So uh, there are about 26 cases that have been reported and the, the snapping or triggering is on, in 19, we're in the tarsal tunnel itself. And those were mostly surgical diagnoses. And so there's only been two that have been described on ultrasound. And then there were a couple that were triggering in the fibrosseous tunnel at the sesamoids. And then uh, a couple, I think only one prior that was at the master knot of Henry. And so I don't know, I wish we were, had been able to, to capture that. Um, but if I would, even though most of her pain was at the at the knot of Henry itself, statistically speaking, it's more common to snap at the tarsal tunnel. As far as what I've read, I don't know if anyone's read any different. Um, <clears throat> I, I wouldn't mind throwing out a couple of comments. This is Doug Hoffman. Marianne, that was a great job. Um, images were amazing. We haven't really talked a lot about protocols um, on this case series yet. I mean, people presented their protocols. We haven't really had a lot of discussion. Um, <clears throat> so my medial ankle protocol is similar, but one difference that I do is, and this, this is really for almost most areas, is I start with joints, and certainly the order you start is, is not important, but and so for my lateral ankle, anterior, and medial ankle protocols, I start with the anterior talocrural joint. Um, mm -hmm. And then I go to the medial tibial talar and talocalcaneal joints, even if I'm doing a lateral ankle, because I think a window into the joint can tell you a lot. I mean, if there's synovitis, for example, um, that's going to affect what happens on the medial ankle. For example, when I do a carpal tunnel uh, evaluation, my protocol starts with the dorsal synovial recesses. Because when I see synovitis there or osteoarthritis, that can affect what happens in the carpal tunnel. And I also look at the medial tibial tail and talocalcaneal joints. Um, about once a year, I pick up a talocalcaneal coalition that is unsuspected and may relate to the pain. And as you know, they're, they're not well visualized on radiographs. Um, and so, again, because I pick up these occasionally, that's part of the protocol. Second thing I just want to mention, as you alluded to a number of times, Marianne, is the cystinacular tali. So for me, that's a key part of the medial ankle protocol and acts as a landmark at the mid portion of the medial tarsal tunnel. And the reason why a lot of things attach there, you mentioned spring ligament, deltoid ligament, um, but also you also mentioned that the FPL goes right over the cystinaculi. And when I'm evaluating the posterior tibialis and FDL tendons for tendinosis, um, I like to do comparison images, and I like to make sure that my comparison images are at the same location at the tarsal tunnel. And so I use the sustenaculi to allow me to get images that are comparative. So you mentioned, you know, size. So typically the posterior tib is about twice that of the FPL. Um, and, and so that allows me to find subtle changes uh, in size as well as echogenicity um, by comparing the exact location in the tarsal tunnel. And I, the other comment I had was just that, you know, Ryan had mentioned the variation in nerves. And of course, nerves are defined by where they end up. And so as Ryan alluded to, by following those, you, you'll pick up the variations. Then my last comment, we haven't talked a lot about this, um, is the report. And so, you know, most of us in residency um, are, are, are pretty proficient, you know, with, with doing, you know, soap notes. I mean, this is what we do from the time we start medical school, but we're not trained in diagnostic reports. And so as you again mentioned, these can be hard. And, and when I get new partners, um, these are the biggest challenge. And so just a couple of things that may help. Um, one is, is, is to come up with a template um, for let's say a medial ankle or a carpal tunnel or a lateral elbow. 
um, come up with a template report. Um, and so my templates are pretty similar. You know, they start with joint, they go to this structure, this structure, this structure, just like we're doing protocols so we don't miss things. And, and I see that more in radiology reports now that they use templates. Um, and so starting a template and then filling in the blanks of the template um, can be helpful with reports. Um, and also off, we, we, we often just read the conclusion on radiology reports, but you know, if you're just starting out, read the whole body of it and you'll get a little more comfortable with the language that is used in the imaging world. Um, because it, it is a skill and it's a hard skill uh, to master is doing diagnostic reports. Um, and so this is a good start with that. Anyway, Marian, I just want to emphasize that uh, that was a really nice presentation. Thank you. Thank you everyone for listening and thanks for your comments. They're helpful. I'm cataloging all of them and working to get better at this. So, all right, Great job, Marianne. So uh, it's eight o'clock. We'll, uh, we'll call it here. Um, so next, uh, next talk will be in two weeks, which I believe is March 19th. Uh, Joey Pietropoli will be talking about distal biceps um, injury. So again, that'll be in in two weeks, same time. Um, otherwise, everybody have a have a great uh, great Friday and a great weekend and great job, Marianne. Thank you.